There are moments when you, you feel the Holy Spirit uh, moving. There's a, an awareness that is heightened uh, as the Holy Spirit is being listened to in a more intentional manner. I, I hope you're experiencing that. I pray you're experiencing that. As we, as we sing a song exclaiming to God that we walk by faith, we can't limp in to Scripture having just said that to God. And singing, I will walk by faith even when I cannot see. Is that true? You know? When you sing these songs, does it make you think like it makes me think of, am I really living like I'm telling God through this message in this song? Am I really walking by faith? There's a stirring within me. It's, it's not going to lead to a different passage of Scripture, but it's, it's going to lead to a, a moment for you to have an opportunity to prove it. So we'll see. For now, let's dive into Deuteronomy chapter 26, talking about how God defines community, what it means to be a community of believers, what it means to walk by faith, what it means to live obediently to God, what it means to recognize the special relationship he has initiated with his people, how we understand that through the Holy Scriptures here and how God initiates his relationship with Israel. We've talked a little bit about their response last Sunday and also this past Wednesday. We continued that and how Israel responded in a variety of ways. For now, we're going to move toward a proclamation that the Lord's commands will be followed. His decrees and laws will be obeyed. Hopefully you can resonate. We will see. Deuteronomy chapter 26, starting with verse 16. Hopefully you were there. Let me invite you to stand with me in honor of reading God's word. Stand if you're able. Deuteronomy 26, 16 through 19. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to him. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he has promised. And we are focusing on God's promise this morning. You may be seated. As I was beginning to dissect what it is, the, what were the notes I needed to take to prepare for the sermon, and, and what message is God bringing to our attention together, I, I started to think about moments in life where you've experienced a heightened state of euphoria. And then I, I started to differentiate that versus holy moments you've experienced in life. They, they can be synonymous, but I think there are also times where they're different. And here's some examples. Some times where I've experienced just a heightened state of euphoria, excitement, thrill, if you will. It could be at a concert, right? A favorite band that you're enjoying. Just a great moment, a euphoric moment. You're just in the moment. You're singing, the crowd around you. It's exciting. It's thrilling to be in an atmosphere like that. What about a ball game? I know we have many sports fans, and you hear me talk about that. A euphoric moment at hand, surely, if you enjoy a sports team to follow and and you're there, and the atmosphere can, can lead to a heightened sense of euphoria and excitement and thrill. I also thought of another moment, maybe one you didn't see coming, a little strange, but I remember vividly when Lillian was two years old, and Lauren and I took her to see Sesame Street Live. And it was a euphoric moment, sitting there with all these little children, and I like, almost choked up. I was like, what's happening to me? I was like, well, I wasn't choked up because I saw, you know, Cookie Monster. Then. It wasn't that, or Elmo. But it was just this moment of, of family with a little one being together that was a thrill. And again, those, they can be synonymous with a holy moment, but other moments I thought of that I, I started to differentiate from that, that, that still are thrilling, but there's a different substance there, holy moments that in worship, corporately, 
maybe private prayer even, had moments in my private prayer time that have been just reverent awareness, a fulfilling, holy moment. Maybe in a conversation with a, another person, whether a believer or a witnessing moment with a non-believer, just a, a holy moment, fulfilling moment of substance focused on what God is doing in the mix there. And, and yes, there is euphoria sometimes associated with a holy moment, right? But I, I noticed a, a difference, a key distinction between these lists, if you will, that came up in my mind. There was an eternal perspective when I focused on the holy moments. The other moments were by and large fleeting. I no longer care about that ball game from yesterday. That memory I had at a concert, that was great, but I don't really ponder on it too much anymore. Yeah, I can reflect on that moment watching Sesame Street, but it doesn't come to mind with the same substance as other holy moments do with that intentional focus of being reverent in God's presence. As Christians, you've heard me say, we are to live with an eternal perspective. So the moments we have are always holy and focused on what God is bringing to our attention and how we obey that which he is bringing to our attention. We are to live, again, you've heard me say numerous times in 2019 with our focus that we've had for the year, we are to live with an eternal perspective. Having eternal perspective means we live with the focus God provides through his commands, his word, his son Jesus Christ living through us. And with the perspective that that alone brings, is the life that we follow and embrace because it matters for all of eternity. Because when we do that, we have that eternal perspective and, and we are impacting eternity. God initiates this. God created us to be in relationship with him and with others. We don't have to muster this strength up by ourselves. We don't have to, to try and, and pray extra hard to make sure this moment is extra holy. God initiates this. Namely, through a receptive heart and mind that we receive the initiation. God defines what it means to have life. We remember talking about Israel and the covenant God set before them. God initiating last week, remember, we talked about a special relationship with a chosen group of people to expose God's love and existence and provisions to all peoples. The Lord formed a godly community. God said, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. God did not deliver his people from slavery in Egypt. God did not set apart a group of people with a special relationship just for their own sake. They were to be a witness. They were to define a qualitatively different kind of community a substance that exposes God's love and how to revere God's presence in all facets of life as God is the giver of life. And with that recognition, others would be invited into this covenantal relationship because they too would adhere to his commands and laws and decrees because they, they notice, they sense, they participate in that qualitatively different kind of community. There's a different substance at hand. There's a substantial difference between relationships with Christians and relationships with non-believers. There's a different substance at hand. And, and this is not neglecting non-believers or our friendships with them or anything like that. We're to be kind and loving and merciful and grace-filled toward everyone, believer, non-believer, right? But there's a different substance at hand in our relationships with other believers, we share an eternal perspective on what God is bringing to our attention for his glory and his purposes. We relate to those who do not believe and have that perspective differently because they, they don't have the spirit living through them to provide that eternal perspective. All the more reason to expose the qualitatively different kind of community that exists among those who have received that and live into that reality. So they will be invited to join in what it means to have an eternal perspective. 
boils down that our eternal destination is different. I don't remember a time I've ever been hellfire and brimstone. I've ever pounded the pulpit. I don't see any markings or scuff marks, right? That's not because I don't have the passion to have us understand that there is an eternal difference for those who do not believe versus those who do. But I don't land on that because that truth alone is not sufficient because it's just head knowledge if we stop there. What do we do because of it? How do we expose why, that rea- why we believe that reality exists? Because if I believe that's true, if I believe that living into God's way of living is the only way to live, then if I don't, then that means I'm not valuing the life God has given me and I'm not respecting the opportunity to have an eternal destination that is with him forever, namely through his son, Jesus Christ. Again, here, God is creating a qualitatively different kind of community. He has chosen a group of people to expose his love and to provide a direction in life so that God's substance in life will be experienced and adhered to and so that others will join in as they see that way of living lived out in real time. Christians form a community of believers that has a foundation from our relationship with God and other believers God does not initiate a relationship just for our own sake. The community of believers does not exist only for its own sake. Instead, the people of God are to live in such a way that it invites others to join in. We do not have a relationship with God only for our own sake. We do not profess belief in Jesus Christ and ask forgiveness of our sins only for our own sake. Yes, we we live into the benefits, the promises therein of those realities, absolutely, personally and individually, but it doesn't stop there. With that said, there's a community of believers, there's a God-defined community that emerges with the same perspective and substance from within that when lived out, absolutely draws others into that same reality. It boils down to this, and Israel had to learn this lesson many times over. So it should come no surprise to us. We see this throughout Scripture. Our life is not about us. I I do want to stop there and ask, is, is that a sobering reality? Is it, is it shocking? I'm not being flippant. I'm being serious. Like, is it, is it, ooh, I, really? I mean, is, if there's shock there, pause on it. Is that shocking that your life's not about you? Again, that's not just some flippant saying, you know, a parent saying to a child, your life's not about you. It's not all about you, right? It's God saying to his children all the time, your life, it's not about you. I created you not just for your own sake to experience existence but to revere God, to love God, to respond to God, and to live in a God-defined community that invites others to do the same. Now, there's a substance worth living for. There's a substance worth focusing upon. There's a substance different that will surely cause people to investigate. The local church is a part of the community of believers that is to invite the surrounding community into experiencing what we're talking about. I want to look at our our Wednesday night ministry. We had our kickoff this past Wednesday night. I don't know, 70 or 80 people or so eating a meal. Community was invited in. The Tranthons had coordinated with others, uh, the principal at Southwood Elementary and uh, they publicized, we have several barbers, salonists. If you'd like to come have your child have a haircut, please do. Have a great meal, Bible study conversation time. Just enjoy time together. And we did. And it was, it was a really great example of what it means to be a community of believers. Right, we're experiencing that now. Here we are, we're gathered together in the same room. There's a, a larger number of people focused intently, hopefully on the same thing, as we come to worship and praise and and sing songs and glorify God and uplift one another and hear his word, right? There, there is an expression of the community of believers here and now for sure. 
But I, I highlight our Wednesday night in particular because that's it's another opportunity to see it lived out in real time out, outside this one hour context that can sometimes be a vacuum, if you will, where it's this, this special bond that community believers have. They come in, they, they do their thing, right? And then they leave. And the people outside that interact with them that weren't a part of that don't really know you did it. That's problematic. You know, for the people to exclaim, yes, Lord, we'll live into your ways. We will obey. And then for them not to see it lived out, that's problematic. Similarly to us, if we come in and and we worship, we spend time together, we become more educated through a discipleship ministry called Sunday School. Right? And we're focused on God's word. We're encouraging one another. We're, we're crafting, honing in our ability to follow Jesus as he lives through us and transforms us. But yet that's not noticeable outside the walls. By and large, it was probably worthless. What do you do with that? What, do you, what are you getting at here? Well, Israelites... Their focus upon God. They promised they would obey. Yes, we will live into your laws and your creeds and your commands. Look at verse 17 and 18 again. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to him. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. Every nation in ancient times had their gods, if you will, but Israel's identity as God's people entailed a lifestyle of obedience to all God's laws, decrees, and commands. And as these values and actions saturated their daily life, other people would be invited to experience and participate in this special relationship. We don't do what we do only for our own sake. But I do need to stop there because I do think that is a surprise for some people and always will be. Again, there's this vacuum mentality, if you will, that when we we profess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart God raised him from the dead and we ask for forgiveness of our sins and we trust in Jesus Christ, that we've entered this special bond with Jesus as we have in this community of believers, and that's kind of it. And and if it is, if it is, we have sorely missed the life of Jesus Christ as he exclaims to go out and make disciples. Where does that substance come from? It comes from God. As God defines community, as we see here, as we've been talking about last Sunday, this Wednesday, as God initiates and defines this qualitatively different community, there's a purpose for it to be exposed so others can join in. Do you live with a focus that your life is not about you, but is to be an invitation for others to join in? Or just notice your conversation. Do you use a lot of I and me statements? I need, I want, me, 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 right? Notice that. Or are we talking about others, literally? Are we talking about how, how we live this out in real time? How our, our worship, I, I want to tell people about it. The way that I was singing and the Holy Spirit moved me in that moment, I need to share that experience. How how the word of the Lord brought something to my attention that's that's challenging me, exciting me, encouraging me, whatever it may be. I need to share this. This is good news. There was an experience, there was a conversation that was hand that was just really encouraging and enriching me and, and how it worked in my life in the upcoming week. I need to share this with somebody. This was just the Lord at work. It was obvious, and I want to talk about it. When you've exclaimed to God your belief in Jesus Christ and asked forgiveness for your sins, you have declared to God that you will follow his ways. As we are seeing listed here and declared here, do you live with an eternal perspective? The goal is not just for our own salvation's sake. 
not just for our own well-being, not just for us to feel good. The goal is for us to live a life that is extremely different than those who do not profess the same. I remember very clearly leading a youth group moment uh, years ago, Sunday night lesson, and we were leading, and we had some new sixth graders come up. I love having that time where we have uh, kind of a new year at hand, new school year at hand. You come up and you get acclimated in youth. It's a wonderful experience. And I remember talking about how we're to live different, I, how Jesus calls us to live different. I remember explicitly saying and asking, don't you want to be different for Jesus? And one sixth grade boy very honestly raised his hand and said, no, I do not. I do not want to be different in my school. I don't want to stick out. And I get where he's coming from. It can be scary. It can be fear-filled. It can be. But when we realize that we have a community of believers that surrounds us, a family of believers that God has defined and initiated for us to live into and be a part of, we hopefully have all the courage and focus and substance that surrounds us and is within us that we embrace the fact that we are to be extremely different than those who do not participate in the community of believers as we do. If you don't, if that's not how you live, why not? I'm at a place now where I genuinely want to know that. Because I need encouragement. I need direction. I pray for spirit-led movement. I need community. Yes, I help lead community. I understand my God-given responsibility as he defines it. But I'm also in this journey together, right? And so if there's something stopping us from participating as a community of believers as God defines it, what is it? I need to be able to share that. I need to be able to ask that. Is it a distraction? Is there a, a, a substance difference inside that the heart is being hardened instead of softened over something? Is disallowing God to work in some area of your life that you know he's been telling you for years needs to be the attention that you give him? Something. Because when we come together like this... I, I don't just go through the motions like this. I don't just come in because it's my job. I remember a friend telling me, well, your faith is easier for you at your job. I told you that before, flabbergasted. The ignorance in that statement is so hard to connect with. So I didn't respond because there was nothing really good to respond with there except love and smile. Right? So I come in to gather together to worship to experience the qualitatively different kind of community that exists among believers. And when intentionality with a specific group of believers comes together and is community, there is strength in going outside these walls and living within the community that surrounds us so that they notice, they experience a difference in substance and are invited to join in. Does your life invite others to join in? There it is. Israel was not given a special, unique relationship just for themselves to experience and sit fat and happy. Yeah, God chose us. This is good. It's all about us. God chose us. We're special. You're not. They acted like it sometimes. We can read through that. It doesn't work well. They once again had to realize, uh, yeah, this is actually God initiating this, showing us how to live. It's all about him. And it doesn't go well when we don't acknowledge that, right? So when we do, our life is supposed to literally invite others into the presence of God Almighty. That should stop you stone cold in your tracks. That whatever I'm doing in life is to invite others into the presence of God. When you do, it's it's beyond fulfilling it's that spirit-led reverent holy moment where you you just know the substance is different there's a power an interaction when god lives through you and you are more concerned 
of focusing your attention on what God is doing than anything else and how you're living that out in real time and other people are, are acknowledging that and seeing that and you get to connect with people in such a way. The power found in that is a substance that I don't want to let go. Yeah, I like euphoric moments too. Yeah, yeah let's go root on a team. It's great. Love it. But that, that pales in comparison to the substance found within the community of believers that goes out and exclaims the good news and lives it out in real time. So, in other words, is your life inviting other people into God's presence because of the relationship you have with him and with other believers? Are we so interconnected that we can honestly all exclaim, yes, I declare the Lord is God and that I will walk in obedience with him and obey all his decrees, commands, and laws? Jesus said, we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. God distills down through Jesus Christ. Jesus distills down the essence of what God is doing in defining community. is to love God and love others. And as we love God and love others, when it's an intentional focus on that and that alone, it invites other people to do the same. Are you willing to exclaim that? Is there something that has your attention in life here at church, here in a ministry, at home, at work, in the community that distracts you from just purely loving God and loving others and living into that reality alone? Because you're gonna now be given a unique opportunity To show it. And what I mean is this, I, I'm very sensitive to how in these, these moments we want to be and we are a church that invites others to come and experience. And I don't expect everyone that comes into a worship service to be a believer. Uh, I honestly hope <laughs> that's not the case, right? If we only have believers gathering together, I think the sermon I just had God speak through was, was not quite what it needed to be listened to, right? And so here's our unique opportunity. I realize that not everybody may be a believer. I realize that we may have someone here for the first time or, or someone who's introverted even. And I respect that. I do. So I realize that this may be a, I don't know, challenging moment. I don't want it to be a moment where you're ostracized or anything like that. But I, I want you at risk of, of you not listening to the sermon, I want you to focus on yourself right now, not because it's all about you, right? But I want you to focus on yourself and yourself alone right now. Nobody else. Don't worry about anybody else in the room right now. Okay? Jesus gives us the law summed up as I just read. Love God and love others. And as we are, are dissecting and understanding how God defines community, how we participate in community as the community of believers, as Jesus lives through us and defines all the law and commandments here by loving God, loving others. I want you to respond with either affirmation or rejection. This is going to look different for everybody, so not everybody's going to be able to look around and say, well, you affirmed, you rejected. It's not like that, okay? So there's an invitation at hand. As I read this scripture, and, and as the praise team comes up and I have a closing prayer, okay, you're going to be invited to stand, to sing, right? But I don't want you, and hear this, this is not to point one out, I don't want you to stand if you don't mean it. Because, not for my sake, I'm not taking notes on that, not for my sake, because if you do, you are exclaiming to God that yes, I will follow you and live into your definition of community as it exists. And when you do that, you can expect to be challenged by that, to live into that reality, to have the eyes and the me's out of your mouth removed. Right? And so if you stand, expect that, be fulfilled by that, it's worth it, I promise. But if, if you don't, I can respect that. You don't want to be disingenuous to God, right? And sit there and pray and let the Lord work with you. And nobody else needs to worry about who's sitting down and why. Maybe they have a leg ache and they just need to sit down. Don't worry about it. 
but I want this to be a moment for you to personally focus your attention on what God is saying to you and how you will respond with either affirmation or not. Listen to this passage of scripture and prayer and the opportunity to be invited to stand. Jesus said, we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. May you pray with me. God, we come before you now thankful for the opportunity you have given us, but we realize the opportunity is not finished. And so, God, as we hear your words speak to us and understand how, God, you initiate relationship and define what it means to exist, that we want to participate together as believers in your son, Jesus Christ, to live into the fulfillment of your law and to obey all you bring to our attention. But we also don't want to be disingenuous. So we pray for your grace and mercy to show us how to be humble before you and let you work through our life that you have given us so we may hand it over to you in whatever way needs to happen right now for us to obey once we go outside these walls. And I pray in the holy name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Carefully choose to stand, if you will, as we sing. And if our God is with us 
Amen. That's right. It is fulfilling to be a part of the family of believers. If you are not, come talk to me. Let's talk about what that means, to love Jesus with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. I hope we enjoy the rest of this morning together. Sunday night, tonight, 5 p.m., children, youth will have an amazing time to be loved on. And let's gather together again as a community of believers this Wednesday, 530, to eat a great meal and see how the week is going as we look forward to next Sunday as well. Amen.